Hello, everyone. We are here with uh, Dr. Ian Scoble today to talk about um, discrimination and discriminatory arguments and how logical fallacies can sometimes play a part in those arguments. So we've talked about cognitive biases, and we're going to talk about something a little bit different, which is logical fallacies and how they contribute to discriminatory statements. So uh, here with, with us we have today Dr. Ian Scoble. He's a philosopher at uh, Bridgewater State University. Uh, he's written, among other things, a book called Deleting the State, which is a work of political philosophy. He's also co-edited um, two books about popular culture and philosophy. One is Woody Allen and philosophy. The other is The Simpsons and philosophy. So uh, a, a really good guy to have around, and we're uh, very happy you could be with us today, Dr. Scoble. Oh, thanks for having me, Kevin. Sure. So like I mentioned, um, we talked before in, in my class about cognitive biases, which are those little um, biases that we have that lead us to snap judgments about things and, uh, in certain directions rather than others. So now we're going to talk about something different, logical fallacies. So um, let's talk a little bit about the difference between a cognitive bias on the one hand and a logical fallacy on the other. So first, what exactly is a logical fallacy? What does it mean to say an argument is logically fallacious? A logical fallacy is when you think that the reasons that you have support your conclusion, but for a number of reasons they don't. Um, now, some fallacies are logical, formal fallacies that result from technical errors in the structure of the reasoning, and others, what we call informal fallacies, are problems that have to do with relevance um, or um, uh, other sorts of um, errors that can't necessarily be formalized the way logical fallacies can, but that have to do with other errors in thinking. And we can categorize these as fallacies because they fall into many recognizable patterns that you see many, many times. And when you recognize the patterns and know what they are, then it's easy to spot them when you see them in other forms with other sorts of um, uh, um, particulars. Okay. So it's the kind of thing where um, you reach a conclusion by a, reason, a reasoned argument, but when you look at the reasons that support your conclusion, they don't really support your conclusion directly, maybe the way you think they do. Sure. Give, to, let me give you an example of, of good reasoning. People will often say that because the first thing implies the second thing, and the second thing implies the third thing, therefore we can infer that the first thing would lead to the third thing. Now, that's a correct way to think, meaning that whatever those three things are, if you're right about the first two, you're right about the conclusion. So, the, so maybe an example of that would be um, all puppies are dogs, all dogs are mammals, therefore all puppies must be mammals. That's correct. If you're right that all puppies are dogs and you're right that all dogs are mammals, it has to be true, 100% necessarily so, that all puppies are mammals because the pattern of your inference is correct. That is, there's a technical connection between the premises of that argument such that they really do support the conclusion of that argument. And that pattern of reasoning would hold valid not just about puppies and mammals, but about any other three categories of objects. Sure. By the same token, we have wrong patterns, fallacious patterns, where the premises do not give adequate support to the conclusion, and there, too, it doesn't actually matter what terms you plug in. It's just a bad way of thinking. It's a bad pattern of reasoning. So just like with good patterns of reasoning, it won't matter what things you're reasoning about. You're either reasoning correctly or you're reasoning incorrectly. Okay. So let's, uh, to give an ex some examples of these, and particularly the ones that I find all the time pop up in discriminatory statements, um, the first one that I want to talk with you about is what, what would be known as an overgeneralization or a hasty generalization. So I think it's a pretty clear example when you look at it of something where you might reason from a certain set of premises, but it does, the premises don't support the conclusion. So you might have something where um, you say, uh, let's say, um, uh, you know, uh, this particular Asian is good at math, that particular Asian is good at math, all of these Asians are good at math, therefore all Asians are good at math. Right. That's where stereotypes often come from, is from generalizing uh, over too small amount of cases. Now the problem with this is we generalize all the time, but sometimes when we make universal claims, 
we have better backing than other times. For example, if you look in your university's uh, fact book and find out that uh, you know 90% of your students have such and such a property, then you're really not on ter terribly bad ground when you assume that this particular student is like that. You could be wrong, of course, but if 90% of them are like that, that's a good guess. But a lot of times we generalize based on a far smaller number of samples. We have two or three cases and they stick out in your mind and then we say, oh well it's all like that. And, and that's not supportable. Um, right. so the thing about generalizations is unless it's 100% of the time you could always be wrong. For example, um, uh, at my institution the vast majority of our students are from our region. So if I pick out any one of the students at random and say, oh, well, I bet this person's from, from the region, that's a good bet. But it could be mistaken. We've graduated students from all 50 states. So there's no way for me to know that that particular student is one of the 1% that doesn't fit the profile. But it's even right. worse when the percentages don't even support your claim. So for example, if I said, well, I'll bet this student um, has a particular religion or I'll bet this student has a particular set of political views or something like this, uh, that's not even well supported. Often what we do is we say, well, you know, I, I went over there three or four times and such and such happened to me. And then I assume on the basis of that that it's always going to be like that or that everybody there is going to be like that. And there, it's even worse than forgetting about the missing five or ten percent minority, we're actually taking what's a small minority, that is in w whatever's in our experience, and assuming that that accounts for the totality. Yeah, it's uh, one of the things that um, strikes me about the hasty generalization or overgeneralization is um, it melds really well with the cognitive bias that the class reviewed, which is called the confirmation bias, yes. which is our tendency to look at evidence that confirms our stereotype and weigh it a lot more heavily. So when you hear people say things like, um, all Muslims are terrorists or all gays are promiscuous. The tendency sometimes is to look out into the world and pay particularly attention to those samples that confirm your viewpoint and then overgeneralize based on that, even though there are examples, like you said, over here that might not fit the case. Uh, I, so I think the danger is, is not that generalizations can't be correct, but that when you add the, our tendency to, to look at confirming evidence, uh, more strongly than disconfirming evidence, overgeneralization becomes even more uh, problematic. I think that's an excellent point. Uh, confirmation bias really f makes a nice partner in crime with the hasty generalization fallacy. For example, people will complain about, well, you know, every time I'm in the bathtub, that's when the phone rings. But really, it's not true that every time you're in the bath, the phone rings. But what happens is the few times that that's what happens. It's annoying enough that it sticks out in your mind and then you don't think about all the times that you go into the bath where the phone doesn't ring. Right, right. Yeah, it's so, um, so yeah, I, so I definitely see the hasty generalizations a lot when I look at statements that usually have a discriminatory overtone. You can kind of unpack them and say, uh, okay, your reasoning uh, doesn't quite follow, the conclusion doesn't quite follow directly. Um, another um, uh, logical fallacy that I want to get to is called the ecological fallacy. Um, I think you said that philosophers may have a different terminology for it. I know statisticians call it the ecological fallacy. And that's when you take uh, an average of something and make judgments about what individual cases must be. So the classic ones that I see are there are studies that show that um, men have on average a slight advantage in terms of mathematical uh, problem solving than women do, and women have a slight advantage in mathematical reasoning than men do. Um, so people then take the average, and it's a small difference in the average, and say, ah, well, that means men are better at mathematical reasoning. Than and even worse, then they'll say, well, therefore, this particular man must be very good at something, right. and I can just assume that this man will be better than this woman or something like this. Right, right. So, um, so what exactly is... Um, how would we define what's wrong? With well, I think part of the problem there is in confusing what is true of the aggregate, what is true of an entire group looked at as a group, and then picking out some particular member of that group and saying, well, so therefore anything that's true of the entire group as a group has to also be true of this individual member of the group. Now, there's times when 
we re again many fallacies get their traction by hooking into some thing that is a good way of thinking. For example, if all humans are oxygen breathers, then when I pick out some particular human and say, ah, well, I bet this one uses oxygen, that's actually correct, and that's a good inference. What's true of the entire group of humans, oxygen breathing, is going to be true of any particular human. But some properties can only be truthfully ascribed to whole groups and not to individual elements. For example, you would say of a large building, wow, that building is huge. But it wouldn't follow from that that every brick used to make the building is huge. Right. So being huge is true of the whole building, but isn't true of the individual bricks that make up the building. So it has to. Do, so whether you can go from the group to the individual legitimately, right? My first example was a legitimate example of doing that. All the humans use oxygen, therefore Bob must use oxygen, right? Versus the times when it's not legitimate, the building is huge, therefore each individual brick is huge. Uh, it has to do with what kind of a predicate. It, it is, and whether it's the kind of predicate that can be ascribed to individuals or only to groups. So when we talk about descriptions of large entities, the building is huge. That's not the kind of predicate that applies to the individual parts that make it up. In, in logic, we call this the fallacy of division. Um, so, and this is this is what happens when people take statistical averages and, and mistakenly apply them to people. This is why, for example. None of my friends have 2.5 kids. Even though uh, the statistical average of amount of children people have or each family has is 2.5. Exactly. It's some, true. It's it true. The average, exactly. six. average is 2.5 kids, but no actual person has 2.5 kids. Yeah. One, um, there's a biologist named Joan Roughgarden who makes a point in a book called um, Evolution's Rainbow. She's talking about diversity of sexuality, and I think it fits really well into this um, fallacy because she warns against it. So she says, so the majority of people may be, be heterosexual and the majority of people may have a sex and a gender that align with each other. So masculine, male, feminine, females. But that doesn't follow that there's not also a huge variation in the groups. Some people are uh, male but they're feminine homosexuals. Some people are male and they're masculine heterosexuals. Some people are somewhere in between. So just because you have an average where the, the most people are heterosexual, it just doesn't at all follow that you should say, therefore, heterosexual is the normal position for everybody. That's right. And in general, this is a problem with confusing what's true of aggregates to what's true of individuals. And when we're talking about people, it's especially important uh, to regard them as individuals and not merely as stand-ins for the aggregates that they're part of. Right, right. So the last fallacy that I wanted to um, address with you that I think is shows up again all the time when, when I look at discriminatory statements is a, is a really tricky one, actually. It's, so we should probably devote a little bit of time to this. It's called the, the fallacy of the undistributed middle, which uh, you know most philosophers are familiar with. And of course, the formal structure is all, ba all Bs are Z. Y is a Z. Therefore, Y is also a B. So the way this looks in some of the statements that I see are uh, all goths wear black. Uh, Jane, uh, Jane wears black, so therefore Jane must be a goth. So you're taking the fact that she wears black and the idea that all goths wear black and, and creating a statement that says, therefore, since she wears black, she must be a goth. So right. what exactly is wrong with that type of statement? Well, what you're, again, the traction that this gets here is by its resemblance to a correct form of reasoning, the one that I used at the beginning, right? If all of the A's are B, but all of the B's are C, then it's correct to say that all of the A's belong to C. What you're talking about there is subsets, right? So you've got this larger set mammals, and so all the dogs are mammals. So if you can think of that as concentric circles, the dog set is entirely within the mammal set. So then if you can find some puppy, right, or some individual thing that's going to be in the dog set, of course it also has to be in the larger circle, the mammal set. Um, what we're doing there is we're connecting two of the terms to each other through this third term, which logicians call the middle term. But when we mean by saying that the middle term is distributed, means that one of your premises has to contain complete information about all of that middle term. So when we say that all of the puppies are dogs, 
and all of the dogs are mammals. That second premise tells me about the entire dog class. That's how I can successfully use the dog group to connect up the puppy thing and the mammal thing. Okay. Right. Now, but in, in your Jane and the Goth example, it's a little bit different, right? It's not all A is B and all B is C. It's Jane is a Jane wears black, and all of the Goths wear black. So the middle term there, wearing black, there's no premise where we learn something about the entire set of people wearing black. All we have yeah. is two things that have the common property of wearing black. It's true yeah. that Jane wears black, and it's true that the Goths wear black. But that actually doesn't give us enough information about that middle term to make that connection. So we're unjustified in saying anything about how the Jane and the set of all Goths connect to each other at all. Look, here's a good example to illustrate the mistake here. Um, uh, Democratic activists are voters, and Republican activists are voters. Therefore, Democratic activists are Republican activists. You see that that's right. self-evidently absurd. All you're saying is that these two groups share a common property, but that doesn't connect the two groups together in any way. So, so if we were to take our puppies or do or puppies or dogs, dogs are mammals, therefore puppies are mammals, and change it to a to, to to illustrate the fallacy of the undistributed middle, you would say something like, I think, all puppies are mammals, all dogs are mammals, um, therefore all dogs are puppies. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, right. In in the sense of being exactly wrong. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of the way I try to explain it to classes in previous semesters about. Um, if you say that all, uh, I, well, to take another example of the fallacy that I always hear, um, gays are feminine, Lester is feminine, therefore Lester is gay. Um, the way I try to explain it to them is, well, well, first of all, all gays are feminine is a questionable assumption, but if we suppose it is true, even if we know that Lester is feminine, um, all we know is that he might be gay. All you have is evidence that he could be gay. He has a property that theoretically all gay people have, but that doesn't mean that's a necessary condition for being gay. No, that's exactly right. Uh, you're correct that, first of all, the idea that all gays are feminine is itself uh, fallacious. That's the hasty generalization fallacy right there. But even if it were true, you wouldn't be able to infer anything about Lester being a member of that group from the fact that he shares a common property with members of that group. Well, and by the same token, right, all gays breathe oxygen and Lester breathes oxygen. You can't make any inference about whether Lester's gay from that. But right. you see that those logically fit the exact same pattern. Um, you're tricked into thinking that that's good thinking because you think you've isolated some essential property, that they act feminine as opposed to something commonplace that they breathe oxygen. But the logical pattern is exactly the same. It's true that all the gays breathe oxygen. It's true that Lester breathes oxygen. But sure enough, you can't draw any conclusion about Lester's membership in the group just because they share this common property of breathing oxygen. But if that's bad thinking, so is the other example. Right. Well, that's great. Uh, we've, we've been covering a lot of ground here. I, I think uh, we'll leave it at those three so that we don't um, you know, put, put too much forward in, in, in the video, although there are tons of logical fallacies that I've seen used in arguments um, that are discriminatory in nature. So I guess to go back to where we started, I mean, there's, there are cognitive biases and there are logical fallacies. And to use the example that I've been using in previous classes, uh, logical, uh, um, cognitive biases kind of illustrate that fast thinking that Daniel Kahneman and others talk about that. They're, they're most um, evident in the snap judgments that we make. So we love to think that we make snap judgments based only on facts and, and that, but uh, cognitive biases influence those snap judgments. Logical fallacies, I guess, on the other hand, really are about the reasoning you use either to get to a position or defend a position. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily the same as, as cognitive biases, but I think they're equally important. Yes, and they can work hand in hand to uh, give you wrong answers. Right, right, great. So uh, hopefully the students, whenever they see arguments like these being made, uh, whether it's in schools where they teach or just as citizens or in news articles or whatever, they can they can go on to challenge them. I hope uh, so. And uh, I, I thank you very much, Dr. Scoble, for, for being with us. Quite welcome. Thanks for having me.